You know, Yip Harbor, the author of all the songs in Wizard of Oz, the lyric writer, he wrote Brother Can Your Spirit Die during the Great Depression, which FDR really did not want on the airwaves. <laughs> but he said one time that words make you think a thought, and music makes you feel a feeling, and a song makes you feel a thought. But I'm going to tell you a story and sing a song I learned from Willie Wall. Willie was born in 1900. I met him in 1988. He was still playing guitar with a quartet for his church that come and collect it every Playing electric guitar and drop D tuning and hitting it as hard as any 15 year old. We just banging on it. It was inspiring. But when I met Willie, it was clear that he'd been really severely harmed by a fire or some, something. And I said, after I got to know him a little bit, I said, well, what happened to you? And what he said, well, I ran away from home when I was 15 with a blues band. 1915, children. Two years on the road, guys up in the coal country working in Charleston, West Virginia, on the black side of town, downtown. They played all Friday night and slept under a table in the juke joint, as they often did, until morning or late morning. And walked out blinking in the sun, which had finally gotten to the streets of Charleston, West Virginia. And um, guitar on a rope around his neck. And he's looking for a little coffee and maybe some breakfast. A church lady accosted him and said, You don't want to make that racket last night? <laughs> That's how Willie said it. He said, yes, ma'am. Gonna do it again tonight, too. <laughs> she said, if you can play for the devil, you can play for the Lord. You come to my church tomorrow morning. She said, I'm gonna be up most of the night. She said, stay up. <laughs> Bring that box with you, but we don't wanna hear no blues. I said, well, maybe I will hope we can get out of this. Um, which church is yours? And she walked him out, and Willie, more than seven years later, could tell you the street corner of that. And he tripped out by Charleston. I forgot that, but he, he told me. He two steps down the street, third steeple down, from 10 o'clock. Well, Willie did decide to stay up. He started thinking about that collection plate. <laughs> Make a little side money. That's good. And he walked in and he played his mother's favorite tune, which I'm going to play for you in just a moment, the way Willie taught it to me. And, and uh, it made him so homesick to be in the heart of the church after two years and for his mom that he quit the band and started hitchhiking home. He's, we, we knew traveling musicians in those days as walking musicians. Exactly. Like nobody had a car. Yeah. And so Willie started to walk home and hitchhike. He got as far as Norfolk, Virginia and ran out of what money he had. He took a job in a reconditioned furniture store. Stripping paint and stuff, you know, they were taking old furniture and re-gluing the joints. Fresh coat of paint, sell it as reconditioned, not new, but we fixed it up, you know. And there's six guys in the back stripping paint and stuff and scraping it and, you know, fumes, turpentine. And Willie's job was to put it in the window and take the money. Willie's 17, 19, 17. Well, they said, you know, I heard the explosion. And the six people in the back, those people died, those men died right in that moment. And I jerked my head around and I could see the fireball coming through the door. And I started to run, but it, it caught up to me. He did this and, and it burned off my eyelids and it burned off the tops of my ears and, and it burned off my nose. And it blew me through the door out into the street. And I wouldn't be here talking to you if some man, and I don't know who that man was, but somebody grabbed me by my clothes and pulled me out away from that brick storefront just before it fell down where I was on top. And I don't know whether he was black or white, I don't know who that man was, but I wouldn't be here talking to you today if it wasn't for him. And I've never been able to thank him. But I lay in the hospital for about two months and the social workers came by and, and they said, Willie, where are you keep?" I said, Faithful, North Carolina, which is where I found him. So well, you need to get back to them because you don't want to go blind in a town where you're 
that people don't know you and don't care about you. Well, they couldn't close his eyes. His corneas were drying out. And they were going to cloud up pretty fast. A couple days, a week, a week more after he got out of the hospital. So they gave him bus fare. They put him on a bus to Fayetteville. But in those days, if you couldn't pay the rent, you moved. And you didn't tell anybody where you were going because you didn't want the landlord to come find you. So Willie's family in two years had moved three or four times. And he couldn't find them. He's wandering all around the black community, losing his sight, each day seeing less. The world's getting a little darker around him. Drinking water out of the ditches and sleeping with jars of moonshine hidden in the ditches behind houses in the black community. And finally one day he knocks on the door and his mother opens. And he is so glad to see her. But she beholds the wreck of a child before her and it says, Mama. Beautiful boy who ran away from home two years before is back. And they fall on each other's neck and they weep. And she gives him something to eat and something to drink and puts him in bed. And he wakes up the next morning stone blind. Made it home. And Willie was one of the happiest, most astonishing people I know. And I have a jewelry box he made for me. He went to the school for the blind in North Carolina to learn craft. He did woodworking. He could make dresser drawers. He called them shipper robes. Well, he could make a three drawer <coughs> cabinet out of one by tens. And the joints worked, and things slid, everything, you know, all, everything worked, you know. Paint jobs were terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and he made what he called jewelry boxes. And I have one in, in our bedroom next to my bed. And the boys know, at least my boys, I need to tell Barb's boys too, something could happen. That if anything happens to me, this doesn't go to the landfill. <laughs> Because Willie gave this to me. And it's a jewelry box made out of one by tens, you know, his favorite wood. Um, it's about this big. It's got a chain that keeps the lid from tip, tipping back too far or falling, you know. But it doesn't tip the box over. I mean, it's, it's, it's right in the right place. The chain is the right length. The hinges all line up. The little latch, the hook and eye latch on the front works. Everything, you know, it's all pretty good. The joints are, you, you can feel them. The joints are pretty good. Again. Paint job sucks, but there's a mirror <laughs> in the top of the, you open up, there's a mirror there. And Willie couldn't see himself, but you might be able to see yourself. And he nailed the bubbling in to hold the mirror with carpet tacks and little pieces, little fern strips of wood. And Willie was inordinately proud. He says, I never broke a one. I never broke a mirror. And he gave me one of these trips. And he gave me this song. <laughs> Till I die. 
compilation record. I'm really proud to have it there. It'll be on the next record. You can hear this again on YouTube. It's called The Lamb That I Love.
This is Rice Rose Again in Vietnam, a song that I wrote back in 1995. It went on a record in 2005, and I finally had a non-blues record that I could put it on. And um, after I wrote the song, I had the lyrics translated to Vietnamese by a State Department translator in Washington, D.C. I figured if they're doing it for the State Department, they've got it. You know? <laughs> I don't want somebody to just some hack to do it. So I paid the 200 bucks to get a song translated. And then I went looking for traditional Vietnamese musicians to work with me on the track. Because I didn't want it to be a song just for American kids. I wanted it to be open to both communities that suffered in the war. And I wrote it from a child's point of view because I'm still so filled with rage about that that I, if I wrote from my point of view, it would be entirely too toxic. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I looked at it back from a child's point of view. And then I went looking for a Vietnamese musician, and I found Nguyen Dinh Nha. And Nia was a, uh, he was an instructor at the a conservatory in Saigon, traditional music instructor, composer, instrument builder, a flute player. Uh, when Saigon fell, he fled into the mountains and lived with the Hmong for about 10 years, waiting for a way to get out of Southeast Asia to come to the United States. He finally found one, but he spent 10 years learning their music as well. Um, and then brought his family to the D.C. area, which is where I found him, with the help of a friend. And, uh, I went to Nia's house, and he was a little nervous about, his, you know, what, what's a white American songwriter? How am I going to fit into a white American songwriter song? You know. But I, I gave him a copy of the lyrics in Vietnamese. His English was pretty good. But, and then I, I sat down in his living room and played it for him. And, he went from being skeptical to being excited. And we started talking about where the flute could fit, and, um, and I said, great. So I left him, we're gonna do this, I'll let you know when the sessions are, you know, I'll, I'll get you there, recording in, in Woodstock, New York with Scott Tito. And that's a good Before we, the sessions came around, we had a stroke. And was rendered, uh, essentially motionless, and he couldn't speak. So his ears worked, his brain worked, he understood what was going on around him, he knew what he had lost, and he could barely move his hands on, on, you know, on one side of his body, and he couldn't talk at all. And when I got the call, I thought, you know, jeez, I can't, I can't believe this is a terrible thing, and, but I still wanted some Vietnamese presence on the record, so I cast around, and Jerry Murata was playing drums. He, Played drums for Peter Gabriel for 10 years. He played on a sledgehammer. <laughs> when Jerry hits the drums, per tears burst out of my eyes. Um, and Jerry had a neighbor, a Vietnamese family, lived next to him. And, and uh, the parents didn't speak English, but they had a straight A uh, high school senior, Duyen Tran. Duyen was, uh, you know, she spoke English. So I sent the translation to Jerry. Jerry walked it over to do again. If he called the house and spoke English, the parents would hang up on you. Because <laughs> they were afraid of do again and having a truck with somebody. <laughs> them not know what was going on. So, so I couldn't call the house. Jerry couldn't call the house. Jerry had to call her sister and have her call the house. <laughs> and tell the parents what's going on. And then, and then, so we worked this out. You know, it's kind of house of cards. The last day of tracking for the record, we were under the gun to get things done, and um, it became clear that somebody had to go pick up the end, and it would be an hour and a half, maybe 45 minutes or 45 minutes back, maybe two hours. And two hours, walking away from these sessions, for me, for two hours, looked like it was impossible. And Jerry Murata happened to be there that day. He wasn't on my dime, he wasn't playing, he was, he'd adopted us, he was hanging out in the studio on the project. He's an incredibly famous musician. And he says, he looks at me and he looks at Scott and he says, I'll go get her. So off the payroll, Jerry gets in his car and drives up against the studio. back and I work with Scott for two hours. And Dewey walks in the studio, willowy, long straight hair, straight A student, sits down in the arm of the chair, we all say hello. I make sure she's got a copy of the lyrics, she has them in the she looks at them and she'd read them through the book for you. She looks at them and she said, 
Why did you write a song about my country? And I sat down in the chair. I said, well, when I was your age, my friends were killing your countrymen. And your countrymen were killing my friends. And there just has to be a better way to resolve our differences. And she went, right. And walked in the studio and read them off. One take, bang. And we cut her voice into the track. So that not only the servicemen who served in Vietnam would hear the sound of that language again, and a young girl speaking it happily, but Vietnamese people would hear it too. And I've heard from both sides, both veterans and, and Vietnamese, that this is a very powerful song for them. So I wanted you to know the length to which I went to make sure that this would, that everybody was in the room. Not just check it out, but join me in the track. Play. So here's the tune. And though the 
worst pain is not gone. Rice grows again in Vietnam. If you have a thought or a question, something that you'd like to talk to me about, let's come up. Please, your question. Yeah, and you talked about performance uh, being uh, to engage and then direct a group of strangers to become friends. Could you talk a little more about that? Yes. Um, we are all used to people sitting in coffee shops, even people who are dating one another, uh, looking at their screens. <laughs> or having a fight. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we live in a world where we are more and more isolated by our technology. And the moments when we might have interaction with somebody, if the technology can solve it, we let it. So, I don't know if you've noticed, but children don't know how to call anybody anymore. They don't even answer email. You've got to text them. Right? So what we offer a group of people is a common experience uninterrupted by screens, except for maybe <laughs> um, what we do is give people a shared experience, a common experience. They take a sip of their own sorrows or joys with us. They don't have to confess anything, but they can have a look at what's inside their closets when we open ours on stage. And we become a community by sampling that stuff in each other's experience without having to reveal anything in particular. It's a safe way to become a member of a group. And when we sing together, as we did, you risk social embarrassment. <laughs> <laughs> and that shared suffering makes you. <laughs> um, so that's why I look at We're just simply united. We take a bunch of strangers who come in and say, like, it was good! <laughs> it was good! Or, not, ah, but it's a shared experience. I think that unites us. We have things in common. When you're on stage, you go first. Someone has to lead this parade. You open the door. And people can either go through or not go through. But that's, that's the community building. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I'd like to hear a little bit more about what you thought of teaching as a performance. Oh yeah, well, as I think I said, you know, we can't flunk people or send them to the office. Yeah. So we have to engage them. And, and the brain learns, this is again brain science stuff, the brain remembers things in sequence. Where are your car keys? When was the last time I drove the car, I came in the house where I put them down? Right? You, but we don't learn things in sequence. If I go A, B, C, you know it's the alphabet, you know the alphabet, you start thinking, I wonder what happens next. I wonder if I should go get a cup of coffee now. <laughs> what about the phone? Oh, I didn't pay the phone bill. So we recall things in sequence. We learned best like this. And every Neanderthal storyteller in Rio didn't start with A and go to B. They started, isn't it funny? Q. Look at Q. Out there by itself. And then Q X. But actually, L M N. But it But I really understand you. Every good story starts in the middle. And lessons should too. They should start with an unexpected fact. And every fact that's presented should generate a question. The person who controls the questions controls your education. So the way to take control of your education is to make questions and ask them. So when I did educational residencies, I would open that and say, I'm going to read you some facts. I want you to write down three questions that come to mind for every fact I present. I'm going to be presenting facts all week long, and I need you to write a question down. Well, if that, then this. What? What about that? Wait a minute. So my favorite one was on a Harper's Index, you know, the magazine. They have these little things. There's a motorcycle gang in Moscow, Russia. This was back before Glasnost. And it has five members. and one motorcycle. 
Go. <laughs> this raises a lot of questions in my mind. I mean, like, can you call a motorcycle gang a motorcycle gang when they've only got one? Are five guys a gang? Are motorcycles hard to get in Russia? Uh, are they highly taxed? Do they make them there? Do they have to import it? How do they get it if they had to import it? Do they pull their money? Who gets it on Wednesday? <laughs> um, I mean, how do you know, you know, if you've got a date, does that trump the guy who's going to ride by himself? I mean, how? There's a lot of questions that this raises that lead us into territory. So by learning to generate questions, you can take control of your own education. You can learn what you want to know rather than what they want you to know. So empowering students to build questions and become questioners is, uh, I think, part of the job of education, especially now. Especially now. Um, Those new professions that they were teaching um, people to go out to the They did what I just, she asked, how did they change the teaching in Africa? What did Wally do? And what he did was he, he didn't teach them sequentially. He said, look, you're going to put the needle in here. And this is really important. And this is why we put it in there. And we clean it before we put it in there. Not clean the needle, do the, 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 no, you start at a critical moment. Something that's important. And you work your way, and then you build in the stuff you need to build in. And the, the emotional main thing, putting a needle in someone else's body, awakens the emotional mind. And the emotional mind will remember in a way the rational mind will not. If you're not invested in what's going on, you won't remember it. We remember things that are marked with emotion, positive or negative. They're easier to set in the memory, and they're more easy to recall. So if you can mark what you're doing with emotion, if you can get investment in that, students will remember. I want to pay homage to, to, to what we do, that we're here together and uh, I love a darkened room. I love the empty stage where I lay my burdens down. I'd prepare to play And when the lights go dark How 